Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave. This is an Imaginative Storm produced podcast, always airing first on WPVM LP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville. Heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, coming out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song. Thank you, Davine Dial, for managing WPVM FM. Today, I have something very different for you. This is the first time on this show I have a guest host. Her name is Beth Orr. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth and we'll see what happens. Here you go. I'm your guest host, Beth Orr, stepping in for James Nave, because today, listeners, you have a special treat. James Nave is our guest on Twice Five Miles. So, James, thank you so much for this opportunity to be interviewing you. It's a real treat for me, because after having our conversation last month, I have some questions for you that I've wanted to ask. So this is this is the perfect opportunity. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate the invitation. I'm glad to be here with you. And thank you for hosting Twice Five Miles. What got me first was I was looking at the title of your show, Twice Five Miles, and I was curious. I noticed that it uh, it came from a Samuel Taylor Coolidge poem, Kubla Khan. Realizing that you've memorized over 600 poems in your life, and that's probably a greater number by now, and realizing that you have that many poems that you know by heart, I'm curious about why this particular poem resonates so deeply with you and why you chose that for your podcast. Well, twice five miles is a term that pops up in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem Kubla Khan early in in the poem. It opens like this. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round. And there were blossoms bright with sinuous reels, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. So the poem is a fanciful leap through imagination. It's one of Coleridge's classic poems you find in the school textbooks. And when I was thinking with my collaborators, Tish Valles and Allegra Houston, about what we could name something, we were just reciting the poems we knew. And we got to Kubla Khan and we got to twice five miles. And we said, well, twice five miles. That's a long way when you think about it. It's like 25 square miles. And I thought, wow, we could just call it twice five miles and say, we will go twice five miles, which could be, could be as far as we wanted to find something. And in this case, to talk to people who are great on this show. So there it is. Love it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I heard you say imagination. And it's interesting to me because imagination keeps coming up in your work. You have the imaginative storm. You mentioned imagination with this. Do you have a certain like tenderness towards the imagination that it keeps kind of showing up within your work? Well, I do have a tenderness toward imagination. I mean, who doesn't really? Because we all have one and our imaginations keep us alive. Our imaginations Mm -hmm. allow us to function in the world We have our dreams because we are able to imagine. We get excited about meeting a friend and going to the movies because we imagine what the connection will be like. And we imagine how much fun we will have at the movies. We imagine all kinds of things. And in fact, when you think about it, most of what we do is imagine because we have to live in the moment. And the moment is right now, which is gone. And now we have another Mm. moment. So I remember the moment that just left and I'm anticipating the moment that's to come and I'm living in the moment right now. But mostly I have to use my imagination to figure out how all of these life experiences fit together. So that's why Mm. imagination is a big theme in my life because it's so obvious. There it sits. And it's Mm. allowed me to 
enjoy so many things. And when you think about our ability to imagine, our abilities, plural, to imagine, and when we think about it as something we've been doing since we were born, just like creativity, we've been creative since we were born, there's an abundance of it. And we have an abundance of imagination as well. Sometimes we forget that. We may name it something else, but we forget it. And it's worth remembering because it is a, an unlimited resource. And that's why I use imagination a lot. And there is a quote from Charles Wright, and I've often said it to people, and I say it as much as I can from his poem, Lonesome Pine Special. And the quote is, or it's really a question, also a quote, what is it inside your imagination that keeps surprising you at odd moments when something is given back you didn't know you had had in solitude, spontaneously, and with great joy? What is it? And, and of course, everybody has an answer for that. It's not a mystery. What is it inside your imagination? That's you. And you're surprising yourself. And how you surprise yourself depends on you, not on me or anybody else. And we all have that capacity to surprise ourselves with the simple things, like the sun rising or the coffee in the morning or a pen that you might buy because you just like the pen because it was purple pen rather than a blue pen. Who knows? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I feel like there was a moment when you interviewed me that I got really excited and you said, oh, I can see your excitement with this topic. And I feel like I saw that excitement with you when you started to riff on imagination. You just, you started to perk up, you started to lean in and you were like, this is obvious. And I was like, I don't know that it really is that obvious. I don't know that everybody has this excitement about imagination like you do. You really shot alive. And it reminded me of, in my own work, intuition and authenticity. I get so excited about that, right? And so I was thinking about when you said imagination, I was like, that's really the part of us that lights up, that's almost like a clue to our authentic path. And if we follow those intuitive nudges, like, ooh, this is taking me somewhere, not necessarily somebody else, but it's taking me somewhere. I'm wondering if that kind of resonates with you, like um, how your imagination has led you on your own authentic path. Well, I think imagination is available to all of us. As I said, we all have it. I get excited about it because I've been thinking about it and I've been noticing it for years. And I've been aware that it's an asset that I have. And like everything else, if you work with it, if you let it move, if you give it some freedom, some room to, to breathe, it will get more and more and more vital. So one person may find their imagination gone quiet, or maybe they're not quite as frisky as another person. But the person whose imagination seems maybe smaller, not as active as some others, I suspect with a little encouragement, and a few good questions, like how did you fall in love with the person you've been with for the last 40 years? You might see the imagination fire up rather fast. I just love to encourage people to think about how powerful their imaginations are and to allow themselves to enjoy that idea. Some people have to go to work. Some people feel confined. Some people are not as joyous because they're too busy filling up the tank with gas. Doesn't mean the imagination is not there, it just means the attention is maybe elsewhere. Is this part of the inspiration to your imaginative storm? It's an offering to others to get them stirred up, get their imagination stirred up? Yes, the imaginative storm is the project Allegra Houston and I've been working on now for the last uh, 20 years and most especially working on for the last three years, developing it more and more. I started using this idea that I call the imaginative storm, inspired by the quote from Charles Wright, what is it inside your imagination that keeps surprising us? And I thought, well, what is it? Well, maybe you could call it a storm. Maybe we could connect our imaginations to the idea of weather and how weather comes in all kinds of forms, the storm being one 
form that weather comes in. Also, there's the wind storm. And after every storm, you have ease. The clouds clear away. The sky is blue again and things settle down. And then later, a week or so, another storm comes along or another weather condition comes along. So I was thinking the mind is full of weather conditions. And mm. sometimes it's stormy, sometimes it's calm, sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm. And it's constantly changing, just like the weather. So the imaginative storm started when I was working with school students in middle school, high school. I was traveling around. This was in the 90s and was invited to teach the students how to write. And the teachers wanted me to do this in a 45 minute time frame. Everybody listening knows how fast 45 minutes can go if you're excited. Well, 45 minutes in a classroom is really short, especially when you engage. And I wondered, what could you do? What could you do, Nave, to engage these students? Not to teach them how to write, but just to get them excited. So I said, to the one classroom one day, I said, you know, just give me a bunch of words. Everybody give me one word. And they were like, okay. And I said, before I get the words from you, let me write something on the board. So I wrote some ridiculous thing like the, the frog and the stone lived beside the wilderness inside the lightning bug jar. Well, it makes no sense at all. The students loved it because it made sense to their imaginations. And then I asked each one of them to just give me some words that they felt like in, were inspired by that image. And we got the words, put them on the board, and then improv to the words. I did the first improv, and of course, it was very, very good, as I'm an expert in all of this, right? And then I said, could I have a volunteer? Student in the back raises the hand, comes up, does an improv, well, is about as good as mine. I'm like, what's going on here? Hmm, I thought I was a genius. And then another one tries it and, you know, it's a very different style, very different voice, still compelling, like looking into a fire or watching fish swim in a large aquarium. And then afterwards, I asked the students to just generate some material, write something in five minutes based on all those words. And there was more to it than that, but we got on with it fairly fast. And the long and short was they were able to generate material the teacher didn't expect. In fact, some of the ones who'd never wrote before were writing stuff down that really surprised the teacher. And I thought, you know, this is an interesting idea. I wonder if this would work again. I tried it again and again and again. And every time I tried it, it worked. And the students generated really interesting material. And... I switched over to teacher workshops. I tried it with the teachers. I said, hey, here's an idea you can use with your students. And it's very simple. So they could get it quickly because teachers know how to take this kind of information in. They put it together. They put their little modules together, went into the classroom, started doing the same thing. And they reported back, hey, this really works. And, and off they went. I don't know how many people ended up using it. I never asked for credit. I just taught the people what I knew and they took it wherever they took it. Although I did have a few people come back and say, you know, we use this and I'm still using it. And, you know, it still works. And so three years ago, Allegra Houston and I decided to take the work that we had done over the past 20 years with this same idea. And we'd done it in writing workshops. I had taught uh, Artist Way Creativity Camp with Julia Cameron for four, five, six years and we taught 18 camps and would have 20 to 80 people in those camps. And I did the imaginative storm poetry thing, every camp, same result. I did it in businesses, same result. People would come up with things. And reason why is because the imagination loves to have a green light to make mm -hmm. things happen. And the other side of that, the internal critic, which often people will talk about because they feel boxed in or blocked, the internal critic can be very loud and can be a bit snarky. The internal critic doesn't quite know what to do with a bunch of words being improved with nonsense because it's mm -hmm. so far away from perfection and so far away from what's supposed to be. The internal critic gives up. Funny enough, what happens the material that emerges 
really pops. So now we have a book called Write What You Don't Know based on the imaginative storm method. And writing what you don't know really is suggesting that there's so much inside of you. You know, in a way, you've forgotten that you know it. So when you research, when you go in, you dig, you play around, you do an imaginative romp through your psychological interior, the swamp of your psychology, things pop out. And when they pop out, you go, my goodness, I didn't know that. Or I forgot Mm -hmm. I knew it. And there's so much inside of us. And we remember it all somehow. Now, can we recall it all? No, not today. Tomorrow, who knows what will emerge? Oh, I feel I feel like we're walking into the same room through different doors. Um, you know, as a licensed mental health counselor, one of the things that I try to do is to get people really excited and engaged in their lives. And I feel like that's what I hear you describing, that you're really setting a tone that there's no wrong answers, which kind of shuts off that inner critic, gets them in this playful space to where it starts to generate this excitement and joy in your life, which is the birthplace of engagement and gets people really encouraged. I feel like you you really have probably not just for individuals, but I think about, wow, how much would that help many corporations and businesses with their productivity if they could create these environments where they would stimulate people and drop all of the shoulds and allow for them to have playful spaces to where they can create. That's correct. And I've seen that happen many times. And you said there are no wrong answers. Another way to say that, staying on that theme of no wrong answers, there are only answers. And the answers will lead you to other answers. And when you have a plethora of answers, you will eventually arrive at a useful place when you put all those answers together. And even what you thought were the wrong ones will turn out to be the primary entry point into an arena that fills itself out with a solution that will work for Mm. whatever your questions happen to be. So the answers become building blocks. And so what we call wrong answers, we could still maybe call them wrong answers, but in their wrongness, they're exactly right for Mm. what we need to have in order to build out the foundation to erect the, uh, the structure, whatever it happens to be, our writing, our our projects, whatever it is you want to build. Have you always had that innate understanding that to follow whatever path kind of comes up without any kind of judgment? What I've learned, I've learned from the people I've worked with over the years. I just observed it. I would observe people Mm -hmm. stumbling along, calling all these wrong answers wrong and being all upset. And then I'll bump into the character a month later and they'll go, well, you know, guess what? I really worked it out. Well, how did you work it out? Well, you know that thing I thought was really wrong? Well, it turned Mm -hmm. out that 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 was the insight I needed to make this happen. So I'm so glad that it was wrong at the time because now it's right. So Mm -hmm. I'm really more of a reporter. I'm just reporting what I've experienced from the people around me, all of whom have taught me these ideas. So Mm. I eventually started to think, well, you know, that certainly looks consistent and it certainly does seem like it works every time. Maybe we might want to subscribe to that notion. So it becomes a lot less difficult to subscribe to it when you've seen it work over and over and over again. It's a little bit like you're probably not going to drive around with four flat tires because you know that if you put air in the tire, the car's going to run smoothly. So it's sort of the same mm-hmm. idea. Who's going to drive around with flat tires when you can fill up the tires and ride smooth? So why not celebrate all of these efforts? The wrong answers, the right answers, all the answers just simply become the answers that give you the right direction to go. Yeah, it kind of reminds me in counseling where when you can help people look at whatever's happening in their life as if they can step back and just look at it as 
this thing that happened to you, it, it could look like it was something that was bad and we label it and we have all this language for it. But what if it's just something that happened? And maybe there, there's even something to learn from it to where it's like, ooh, if I'm just curious and I kind of take a stance of curiosity and say, well, I wonder which direction feels right for me to go given how this turned out, right? It kind of reminds me a little bit of that, of if you maintain a perspective of curiosity and openness and shift your relationship with what's happening versus you have to do something right and wrong, then it kind of unlocks you as you're moving forward. That's true. I do want to make sure that I say we can really slip up. I have made some mm -hmm. boneheaded choices in my life that really took a while to correct. So I'm mm -hmm. not sitting here saying the boneheaded choices that I made created a bed of roses in my life is all wonderful all the time. What I am saying, though, those boneheaded choices that I made 30 years ago inform choices that I made 10 years ago in a way that those choices were more meaningful and more productive. So I was able to draw from the boneheadedness, and I love that word rather than wrong, the boneheadedness, just like clumsy, thoughtless, whatever it was that I did. I, I drew from the mistakes and tried to turn them into, and did indeed, turn them in, into solutions. Tomorrow, just like today, I have more mistakes I can draw from. My mm -hmm. boneheadedness didn't get cured. It's still with me, but that's okay. At least I have a better relationship with it. And I know that these flubs can be turned into assets with the, the right mood. I, I think about our lives, like we have these emotions and we have these like invisible strings that we're kind of drawing on right and each thing that happens to us kind of tugs on a different emotion or a different experience from the past and i've been thinking about your work and in the body of work that you do and and i'm curious about kind of the evolution of james the evolution of you and and i would wonder sometimes with people there's a a theme that they see as they unfold. It looks like there's all of these disconnected things that they're doing that aren't necessarily part of each other, but yet often there is like an undercurrent or theme that's a part of people's choices. And I'm wondering if you recognize anything as kind of a theme in your evolution. I have one theme that seems to reoccur and it started years ago. When I was growing up in Western North Carolina, eight, nine miles out of Asheville on Brevard Road, back when Brevard Road was a two-lane road going to Brevard, North Carolina, the woods were there. The Biltmore Estate was on one side of the road, and the, the land where we lived was on the other, woods behind the house, and there was a church a mile away called Sardis Methodist Church, and if you go out on Brevard Road today, and you drive through what is no longer a country, it's commercial, you will see Sardis Church sitting on Brevard Road and on the corner of Brevard Road and Sardis Road. And you'll see a steeple on Sardis Church, and that steeple is the steeple my grandfather built. And it's still there to this day. And if you see the church, it looks out of place because it's surrounded by all of the retail commercialization and yet the church was well-placed when we were growing up. The theme I have, I would walk to church sometimes, and in the evenings, especially during the summertime, I would walk to the Methodist Youth Fellowship. It was a Methodist church. And I remember one evening walking up to the Methodist Youth Fellowship. I was not that religious, but I did love the company, right? Everybody was great. I liked, I liked going up there and hanging out with all my friends. And I had my trousers on and my little shine shoes and a, and a little jacket and a press shirt. And off I went. I was 15. And I was walking down Brevard Road, looking at the mountains, thinking about my father going to work every day. He worked at the power company, Carolina Power and Light. And every day he got up and would grab his lunch pail and get in his little Jeep. He drove a company Jeep. It was a brown Jeep with a ready kilowatt on the side. 
and he would drive off to work. And in the evening, he would come back and his lunch pail would be empty and he would come home and the next day he would get up and do it again. And that afternoon, I was walking down the road and I thought, you know, I really, really don't ever want to have to work day after day after day like my father does. I just don't want to do that. There must be another way to do it. There must be another way to make a living without having to go week after week with vacations. Now, my father enjoyed it. He liked working. He climbed the power company ladder and became a supervisor. He retired well. Uh, he was also a musician. He played the fiddle. So he loved he loved his work. He loved to work and he loved to play the fiddle. So no shade on my father's job. But for me, I was like, there's got to be a different way. So walking toward the church that afternoon, I remember thinking, I wonder what that way is. And I believe that's when this theme of finding something beyond the mountain really set in. What's over that hill? What's over there? And can you go there? And later, not too far down the line, when I was 20, I did my first hitchhiking trip. I-40, Canton exit to Denver, Colorado, 1970. And the trucks downshifted for the curve, and I was hoping to catch a ride all the way to Denver, which I didn't. But I did get a ride with a guy named Wayne who took me to St. Louis. And from there, I crossed the mighty Mississippi and went west through Kansas on the slow, gradual incline to the Rockies. And the Rockies mm -hmm. are still there to this day as they were there a million years ago, long before we were born. So that became my theme. What's on the other side of the mountain? And mm -hmm. I didn't start out as a poet. I didn't start out as a spoken word artist. I just wanted to make a living doing things that I enjoyed doing. And most of my life has been in service of that goal. Did it work out like I thought? No. Did I continue to do it? And am I still doing it to this day? Yeah. Would I recommend it for somebody else? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Would I do it over again? Sure. I would still go out on I-40 and stick my thumb out and hope for that ride west with some guy named Wayne. I love that story. I mean, and it, and it also shows kind of how in your theme that curiosity and imagination were an integral part of that early on. Uh, yeah. And the imagination came because my grandmother, Roberta, who graduated from Meredith College in 1919 and came to Western North Carolina to Murphy to teach school and be a missionary in 1919, or maybe it was even somewhere between 1916 and 1919, quite a ways back, right? And she lived near where I lived on Brevard Road. She was just down the, the lane, Pine Lane. And Roberta was always writing poetry and she would correspond with authors. Mm -hmm. And she was a very well-educated woman and, and not many people graduated from college. And she was one of them. So she told me that there were mysteries over the mountain. And those mm -hmm. mysteries would come and find me. And then I could go away with the <laughs> mysteries. And I would find something out there with those mysteries. So she did stir that up. And my mother did too. And my mother would always quote lines of poetry to me, like Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And she would say, you are a part of all that you have met, yet all experience is an arch, where through gleams that untraveled world, whose margin fades forever and forever as you move. And mm. that was a line from Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And you know, you are, you are a part of all that you have met. We are a part of all that we have met. That's why the imagination is so important because it was one of the first things we met. And we became part of it and it became part of us for the day or a certain part of the day or for, for many years or stretching cycles of years and continues as we go forth every day like children, which is a Whitman reference. So 
you talking about your mom and your mom recounting or reciting poetry, not a lot of people recite poetry. And so here, here you have this role model who's, who's doing this and sharing this with you, kind of normalizing that. I'm wondering if you remember the first time that you memorized and recited a poem out into the world and what that experience did to you inside you. I didn't start memorizing and reciting until I was 30 years old. Okay. I was actually 32, but the first astounding experience I had with memorization, I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this was just after I'd hitchhiked to to Colorado and back. And I returned from Colorado and it was during the Vietnam time. And I had decided the way I would deal with Vietnam, I would apply to become a conscientious objector. So I became a conscientious objector and I had my status and I was working at a nursing home in Charlotte called Wesley Nursing Home. And I was living on 7th Street in Charlotte. And my college roommate at Brevard College, where we had gone and at the time, Brevard College was a junior college, lived on Brevard Road, went to Brevard College. Hmm. Brevard College is now a four-year college. He and I were walking across a park in Charlotte, and he recited the Gettysburg Address. Not that big a deal. I don't even know why John Wyatt recited the Gettysburg Address, but he thought it was a good idea walking across the park. So <laughs> I'm walking along, listening to John recite the Gettysburg Address. And Beth, I was just gobsmacked. I was just gobsmacked. How could somebody possibly do that? And then years go by. So by the time I got to my 30s, I decided I wanted to go back to college. So I went back to school at the University of North Carolina at, guess where? Asheville, UNCA. So I went back to UNCA and I enrolled at age 31 at UNCA, I was there and I took a romantic literature class taught by Wilsonia Cherry, Dr. Wilsonia Cherry. And she was so bubbly and she just loved literature and thought it was the best thing that anybody had ever invented since anybody had ever existed. And so she said, I'm going to read a poem for you now. So she opened up the book, Norton Literature, and started reading Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And so she started out and I didn't really recognize it, but I was an earnest student wanting to make good grades now that I was more mature. And I'm listening and taking notes and really excited about this poem that I wasn't sure I could even understand because it was a poem for God's sakes. And who understands poetry, even though my grandmother recited it, this and that. And then when Wilsonia Cherry got to the line, I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever as I move. It was like the entire Broadway lighting mm -hmm. system flashed across my imagination. I thought, oh, I, I know something. I know something. Oh, my goodness. I know something. And so that day I went down the hall to the office and said to the person in the office, could I get a copy of this poem. I'm going to memorize it. And I put three copies of Ulysses in my back pocket and in my notebook. And off I went. And it was a 72 line poem. I don't recommend anybody start with 72 lines. It took me forever to do it. But I actually, actually got it memorized. And in the course of memorizing that poem, this fellow named Bob Falls, who still lives in Asheville, said to me, well, if you memorize one more poem and you have Ulysses and I memorize two or three short ones, we'll have a show. Let's do a show, a poetry show. And I said, why not? I've got one, 72 lines. I'll get 12 more lines. I at least know I can do it. And we were inspired by Connie Reagan Blake and Barbara Freeman, the folk tellers. Connie Reagan Blake's still telling stories. She's really well known in Asheville and does all kinds of workshops. And Connie and Barbara had had invited me to come to the National Storytelling Festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And that was in 1981. 
And I went and saw all the storytellers. So when I started memorizing Ulysses, I thought you could tell it like a poem. You could tell it like a story. And I thought we could be poetry tellers. Why not? And that's how it started. So it was agonizing for me to memorize that first poem. I don't, it took six months. It was terrible. But the reason why was because I was going about it the wrong way. I sat down and put it on my poor little knees and held the paper and went over the lines it little prophets that an idle king by this still heart, still hearth among his barren crag, crag crags. Little prophets, little prophets that an idle king, idle king still hearth. You know, oh my God. Okay, let's let's try it again. It little prophets that an idle king. Okay, it starts out it little prophets. So I started with the first line and got stuck on it like a a Ferris wheel because I didn't understand that memorization is not about sitting down and taking it in. Memorization is about allowing yourself to have a relationship with a piece of work that might take you a whole year to memorize whole year to learn thy heart so it doesn't matter how fast you do it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong and here we are back to right and wrong when you don't remember it when you think you do have it and you don't remember it that's the best moment in memorization because it's opening something for you and it's suggesting mm -hmm. to you go back and revisit that little notion in the poem revisit it dwell with it spend some time with it only that for a whole day one line whole day that will do you and eventually mm -hmm. what will happen is you'll just know it it'll be there and it'll be there in its own time and in its own way with its own magic and it will be in your heart and then you will have a relationship with the poem and so you will have it memorized but you will be so much more engaged with it than what we traditionally think of as memorization. So that is why I love this idea of imagination. I like memorization. And that's why when I first started, I was so grateful to stumble because it taught me how to continue to stumble. And to this day, stumbling is one of my great joys. I, I love that story because I feel like it frees up so many people. Like w when I was thinking about you as a poet and memorizing all these poems, I was like, oh my gosh, you must have this innate capability to, to be able to do this. And you sharing that story, I think is so beautiful because what it reminds us is this, that when you talk about this relationship, it really frees people up from their perfectionism and having to choose something that they're just innately good at. But instead, what you're describing is this flash of intuition, this something came to you that felt like a spotlight, you described it. And you had this moment that you just wanted to follow something. And if you had been in your head about it, and you had been thinking about how, oh, I'm just not innately good at this, I'm sitting down, I can't remember this. But instead, you, you had this relationship with the experience, which allowed for you to just enjoy the journey. And then it somewhere along the line, it clicked and you had this whole experience. Exactly. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. how it happened. And the reason I know so many poems, is not because I'm some great memorizer. What Bob Falls and I did when we decided to be poetry tellers, we thought, well, how would you sell that idea to a group of people who would even want such a thing. And of course the conclusion was middle school and high school and elementary school teachers would like that. They would like to see two people performing in a lively way, poems that are in their school textbooks. They would like to have the two people performing the poems, then come into the classroom and show the students how to memorize so they could better understand the poetry they were studying in the classroom. And the teachers all saw very quickly that this would make their job easier because when you have an enthusiastic classroom, it's much easier than one that is not enthusiastic back to the 45 minutes going by fast in a classroom. And we put together this idea of poetry alive. 
And we thought, well, okay, can we find some teachers that would like for us to do that? So our hook was, we'll memorize whatever you send us and we'll do special memorization for you. And then we will perform those poems in your school so your students will be able to see what they're working with in the mm -hmm. school textbook. So the teachers started sending us poems. You know, the road not taken, starting by was on a snowy evening, the Ernest Lawrence Thayer's Casey at the Bat, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, Mending Wall by Robert Frost, uh, The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop, uh, lots of Emily Dickinson, lots of Ogden Nash, lots of little short poems. And mm -hmm. we quickly realized that as we memorized, the more we memorized, the more we realized that we were creating themes for the students. So I figure that at the end of the day, after 30 years of doing this, I probably have memorized 600 poems in one way or another. Now, most mm -hmm. of those I have buried somewhere. I can't recall most of them. I can't do the chambered Nautilus. I can't get through Paul Revere's ride. I probably could maybe get halfway through the highwayman. And a lot of the poems I just memorized one time and went on my merry way. But we did do it off book. But I will tell you this, that we would get up there in front of the class. And the first time I memorized Paul Revere's ride, I did it as a request. It's a very long poem. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It's very rhymy. And I don't remember much of it at all now. But the day I performed it, I, Paul Revere rode to Miami, I suppose, and back. I don't know where the guy went, but he didn't go across the bridge he was supposed to in the poem because I couldn't remember the thing. So it was awful. It was just terrible. I finally got through it, you know, midnight ride of Paul Revere. And, and, and I thought, OK, this is it. We'll never have another job. And the teacher came up and said, thank you so much for memorizing that point. My students appreciated it so much. And I thought, well, are we talking about the same piece? <laughs> oh, it's just great. It's just great. And so that was when I, I realized that it was really good to just throw yourself into those things. What brings to mind for me is, is it's about the experience that the people that were listening, your audience, it was about the experience of listening to you share this the actual words and whether or not you nailed it a hundred percent really didn't matter. It didn't make any difference at all. And what yeah. made the, what made the difference was we were willing to show up and attempt something. And mm -hmm. we were willing to say to the teacher, okay, we'll, this is what we could do for you. It won't be perfect. It will be what it is today. Now later we got, I got Paul Revere's ride down and it was okay. And I was fine with it. Mm -hmm. But that day, it wasn't so good, which also brings us around to this idea of perfection. And perfection can never be achieved because it already has been achieved. We're living in a perfect universe. All you have to do is look at the springtime in Asheville right now or anywhere in, in the northern hemisphere as it comes out. And you're looking, you're looking at perfection and you're a part of that. So we are not charged as creative people to achieve perfection. What we are asked to do is creative people, and everybody is creative because we were born that way. We wouldn't survive otherwise. We're just asked to show up mm. and explore and play and, and work and be there and see what happens. Yeah, so kind of, kind of going back to, I'm, I'm really interested in the experience of when you do share this, like in that classroom, when you were sharing this with, with the kids or when the first time that you that you shared a piece on stage, what does that do inside you? What's that experience like, the emotion like? Well, the first time I remember sharing something substantial on an official stage was in 1984 when Bob Falls and I put together a two-hour poetry show and invited 60 of our friends to come to a listening room in Black Mountain called McDibbs, which was the only listening room in the area in the 80s. Actually, Gray Eagle, which is in Asheville yeah. now, mm -hmm. can trace its roots back to 
McDibbs in Black Mountain, owned by a fellow named David Peel in the late 70s and early 80s. And when I say listening room, you had people like Tosh Mahal, Jerry Jeff Walker, Doc Watson, or three that come to mind, Gamble Rogers, uh, Annie Lally, who's here in Nashville now, still sings now and then, was a big hit there. David Wilcox came later, and David earned his chops on the stage at McDibbs, and so did D David Lamont as well. And those fellows are friends of mine, and they've been around for a long time. Annie and I are friends. So McDibbs was the gathering place. And in the 80s, we would show up there all the time. It was almost like church for people. And mm. we decided to do a poetry show there. So we booked the show mid-August 1984, and we worked all summer. Oh, my gosh. We rehearsed, 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 rehearsed. And if anybody wants to know how to do public presentation, it's really simple. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse until you just can't do it anymore. You Then you go out and you do the show. And hopefully you have somebody that can help you with it. We had a director named Cal Groshish who helped us. So Bob Falls and I were the team and Cal did the direction. We were rank amateurs. I had no idea how to do this. Had no no basis in acting or anything. I was taking a few acting classes at UNCA and we were doing it during the time I was going to UNCA. So I was involved in theatrical productions, but I was so new at it that I had no idea how to do it. I just knew that poetry was a theatrical opportunity. So why not? So how did it feel? The room filled up with all our friends. Everybody paid $3 to get in, which was a nice sum back in those days. And I walked out on that stage and I felt dizzy, not from excitement, mm -hmm. but because I had never looked at people in an audience before and they all looked different. And it was so confusing. I had no idea I was going to have that experience. And I remember their faces all moving around and I was thinking it would be one solid experience, but it wasn't. That settled down, and we did the show. And I don't really remember how I felt. I just wanted to mm. I just wanted to get the words out. It was two hours, and mm. at the end of the show, everybody cheered and thought it was great. And I felt really good because I felt like we had actually done something. Turns out we had invented the sliver of what would become the spoken word poetry movement. There were a lot mm. of people during that time inventing and using spoken word in whatever fashion they felt like using it to express whatever they wanted to express. We didn't know that. We were just down in Asheville at Black Mountain yeah. reciting classic poems. But there were other people all over the country starting to explore that idea at that same time. And eventually all of that collected into what we now have, as some people call the spoken word community experience. So that's how it started. And I was just standing on that stage reciting those poems, a bit terrified and confused, really. But afterwards, a woman named Joan came up and said, would you guys like to do the same show three months from now at Beaufort, South Carolina? I'll give you 400 bucks to come down and do the show. We thought, well, we already have it prepared. Sure. So that's what got the thing started as a business. We went off and did a show and we thought, well, if we can do it in one place, we can do it in another, in another. And a great example of how, despite whatever your personal experience is with what's happening, other people are having their own experience. Other people are are receiving this and like they didn't anything that you were experiencing in here didn't even didn't even capture their attention. Well, nobody even cared about me. They cared about themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And I keep hearing and as you describe the different projects that you're working on, it seems like collaboration has given a lot of confidence and, and synergy to whatever you're working on. That seems to be particularly important. Well, collaboration does have a great value. And I've always collaborated with people. And I think we owe it to ourselves together and to work together. When you think about songwriters, they get together and they write songs together. 
songwriters don't sit down and scratch out on a piece of paper and put music to it. They noodle, they wiggle, they play, they toss out lines, they record everything they do, and then they put it all together and make some kind of song out of it. Mm -hmm. And they do it together very often. Mm -hmm. Not not always. I mean, some songwriters will kick out something and they'll have it and it'll be completely their own. But even that is a collaboration with all they've known in the past. So even when you're working alone, you're collaborating with all of the people that you've encountered over the years. So I value collaboration and I've gotten a lot out of it and continue to do so to this day. I mean, in a sense, you and I are collaborating with this podcast. This is a collaboration. You're co-hosting my show or you're hosting my show and I'm the guest. How much more collaborative could that be? Absolutely. I think that's the, the perfect way to end our time today. I was thinking a thank you for your collaboration with me. Um, my podcast is Click Moments, and it talks about how you have certain information right now, but there's something that you learn, a click moment that happens that takes you further. And I think I've had several click moments myself, and, and I'm sure your listeners will um, also, based upon um, our conversation today. So I thank you for your time and allowing me. It was a real honor to uh, guest host your show today. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you ever so much, Beth. I really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's great. Thank you for co-hosting. It makes my my job easier, or maybe not. Maybe as a, as a guest, it was more difficult. I don't know. But thanks anyway for doing all that good work. Thank you. Thank you, Nave, for allowing me to co-host Twice Five Miles. This has been an incredible experience, and I hope that you invite me back sometime to uh, join you and have other conversations worth remembering. Thanks, Beth. I appreciate it, and the door is always open. And there you go, my friends. The first time on Twice Five Miles Radio Podcast, my guest host, Beth Orr, and I was thrilled to be her guest. It was kind of different, flipping it around from interviewing people to being interviewed on this show. And it was fun to talk about all those early experiences, getting up in front of people and trying to tell stories, tell poems, this and that. All these years later, I'm fairly comfortable with it. But I have to tell you, just to end this show, a little note that I didn't give to Beth when she was interviewing me. When we were doing those shows, one of the ways I compensated for my nervousness was to overdo it. I would be loud and big and raucous, and I would move my arms at great waves across the stage and through the air, and subtlety was not my strong suit. Overacting was my strong suit. So if you need a, a class in overacting, I'll be glad to give you one. I learned how to do it, and yet I really never did learn how to do it. So even to this day, I can be overly performative because I get nervous even now, and I try to hide behind my authenticity or, or hide behind my performativity, which obscures sometimes my authenticity. So if you're thinking about getting out there and doing some work on the stage, some spoken word work, or a, a public speech, or some kind of presentation. I really don't quite know how to tell you what to do to get out of your way, other than dial it back a little bit and, and be yourself, and attempt to say something meaningful for someone to listen to. And I try to do that. I'm trying to do that right now. And it's even a little difficult as I'm doing it for you as we close this show. But hey, we have this moment and this moment only. We show up. We do what we can do. Like Beth Orr showed up and interviewed me because she wants to do her podcast. So in some ways, we're all in this together, my friends. And I'm, I'm glad to be part of your life for just a little bit of time. And I thank you for tuning in and listening and being part of mine and part of uh, Beth's life today. And on that note, I'll just say, once again, you've been listening to Twice Five Miles Radio. Fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave. This podcast is sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Project. From the imaginative storm to the creative form, we say... 
and the creative form comes in many, many different fashions. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com, if you'd like to know more of Walter's music. Thank you, Devine Dial, for managing WPVM-FM. We really do appreciate that. And if you're living in Asheville and feeling a bit restless, you can always take a walk around Beaver Lake, North Asheville, Merriman Avenue. And if you're living in Taos and you feel a bit restless, you can always take a walk in Kit Carson Park and ask the magpies to tell you a story. So thanks ever so much for tuning in. Hey, I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line. <laughs>